Hello, everyone. My name is Mary Brown, and I'm the guide manager here at Alpine Ascent International. Uh, this is our Great Peaks of Bolivia webinar. It's going to be amazing. I'm really excited to hear from Rachel. I am streaming in from our world headquarters in beautiful uptown Seattle, Washington, on the unceded traditional lands of the Coast Salish people, including the Duwamish people, past and present. The star of our show today is our Bolivia program director, Rachel Molstad. Rachel has lived in La Paz, Bolivia since 2013, guiding in the Cordillera Real Royal Range of the Andes and exploring the region's remote glaciated peaks and granite walls. She, she has been guiding full-time since 2014 in various regions of North and South America with extensive experience in high altitude and international expeditions. She has completed numerous female first defense of technical routes on the highest peaks in the Bolivian Andes, along with a few first ascent routes on lesser explored peaks. Before I turn this webinar over to Rachel, just a couple of housekeeping notes. If you have any questions during the presentation, just pop them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And then in the chat, I'll be dropping in helpful links and other things uh, throughout the webinar if, um, yeah, if, the, if it seems appropriate. Um, I'm gonna turn off my camera in a second. But um, while Rachel is getting everything set, if you could drop in the chat your name, where you are streaming in from, and what interests you yep. in the Great Peaks of Bolivia. Okay, without further ado, Rachel, over to you. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us in the webinar today. I'm super excited to share a bit more about a place that has uh, fascinated me and become um, over the last 10 years or so. Um, the Great Peaks of Bolivia trip concentrates on several peaks in the Cordillera Real, which is translates to the Royal Range of Bolivia. And uh, this, I'll just mention this photo here is actually one of our teams hiking into the base camp of the Chachicumani region. Uh, the peak up in the corner, you can see right here is not the summit. This one is actually a little bit back behind it, but that's uh, one of the peaks. It's a super scenic, um, remote, glaciated peaks. My goal is to, I'm assuming we have folks um, on this webinar who are maybe signed up for a trip coming up this year, thinking about it maybe for next year, and then other folks who are just uh, curious what this what Bolivia climbing in Bolivia is all about so I hope to give you information for both of those groups any questions that come up anything that you're curious about uh, write it on the uh, chat function and we'll uh, get to a question and answer time here a little bit later and I'd love to answer the questions that come up uh, I thought we would start with a little bit of an view of where in the world <laughs> uh, Bolivia fits into the Andes it's a kind of a spot where you if you haven't been to Bolivia or, or thought about it much, it's a little bit hard to locate on a map, and that's part of what's kept it as a, a really fun climbing secret. Uh, Bolivia is a landlocked country in the heart of South America. If you take a look at the picture over on the right here, over the curve of the Andes going down the entire Pacific side of America, and Bolivia is right here in the middle. So it's just this fun spot on the map where if you see this this pretty unique curve of the Andes and the Andes form a high altitude plateau they kind of split off on two sides and form a high altitude plateau in the middle um, one of the world's pretty great special uh, high altitude areas and so on one side here uh, on the Pacific side we have a range of mountains that are volcanoes and then high altitude plains in the middle and then on this side backing up to the Amazon we have another range of mountains, which is the, the Royal Range is part of that, uh, all part of the Andes uh, together. And that area is where we get to focus in on this trip. Uh, if you see this photo here in the middle, this white section here is the Royal Range. And see how it's backed up by the Andes, or so by the Amazon on the back. So the interesting thing about this range is it's quite near the equator, about 16, 17 degrees uh, below the equator. But we have these huge glaciers um, with all the humidity that comes up off the Amazon and then crashes with the high altitude plateau, jagged uh, peak structures just from tectonic forces, uh, all combined with uh, the Lake Titicaca, one of the world's 
biggest high altitude lakes, highest uh, commercially navigable lake, lake in the world. And so you get the backdrop of the peaks and the lake and then the Amazon on the backside and this desert plateau. And it's just this really, really interesting spot on the map that's um, for me and, and for a lot of folks who've come down has been really, really fun to explore. Doesn't look like a huge range when you look at it on, but when you get in there, this is what it looks like. So this is a view from the summit or near the summit, not quite the summit of Chachikamani, one of the peaks that we climb on this trip. So the Bolivia's Royal Range is only about, it's about 80 miles long, depending on which sort of size you cut it off to measure it at. But in there, there's estimates that are there about uh, 600 or so peaks that are above 5,000 meters, which is about 16,400 feet. So a small area packed in with all these different jaggedy peaks, glaciers, uh, really, really fun little corner of the globe. So why Bolivia? I uh, wrote down all sorts of thoughts on this page uh, that you can take a look at here. It, Bolivia is a spot where it's really off the beaten path for climbing, um, but we have these peaks that are quite accessible, uh, easy to get in and out and climb multiple peaks, success from the city and not uh, a lot of peaks we have to spend a couple of weeks working our way up to one peak but in Bolivia we get to pop in and out of different mountaineering areas really easy. spectacular scenery uh, you will have on this trip we have a variety of different sort of styles of climbing in, in many ways we'll talk about that a little bit uh, further on it's a great itinerary for folks who have um, maybe you have taken say a six-day mountaineering course and you are looking for ways to move up to bigger mountains, higher mountains, gain more experience. This is a trip that is accessible for somebody who is at the point where you have some basic skills on crampons, glacier, glacier travel, um, but you're looking to expand those skills. Great attorney for that. Um, but I would say the majority of the people that we have come on this climb are the folks who have traveled all around the world. They've gone to all the popular places and they're looking for what else is out there. And, and it's it's a really unique destination and a lot of fun for that kind of climber as well. So I think it hits a lot of different uh, buckets for who it's appropriate for in that sense. Um, you will also find one of the special things about Bolivia is the way that people are living and the way that you see them doing things, the food they're eating. Uh, a lot of that has not changed in hundreds, sometimes even a couple thousand of years there. And it's not a country that has actively sought out tourism. Um, really throughout its history. So you will find that uh, the way that they are doing things, they're not doing those things to, to attract tourists as a show for tourists, the, the culture and the life and the way they are, that is their lives and that is who they are. And that's, I think, something really, really special to, to experience as well. So definitely um, a country that will climb on peaks that are off the beaten track means they are not at all crowded. Not at all. <laughs> um, we are most of the time, not all the time, can't guarantee, but most of the time we're the only people climbing on the peaks uh, that we're climbing on. And that's something that's really special, I think, in mountaineering in the world today. So uh, know also that going to someplace that's really off the beaten track there are some things that are a bit more challenging with that. So I'd say this is also suited for the traveler who is a little bit adventurous in that sense. You're willing to, uh, Say when we we tour around the city, or maybe you come a day early and you're you're wandering around La Paz, like the, the city by yourself, people will kind of look at you. Um, they might stare a little bit. Don't expect to find a lot of people who speak English, even in stops that are geared toward tourists. All the pieces are sometimes just a little bit more complicated. Um, but that's if you're ready for that, then highly rewarding. And law, so almost no pockets in the photo there. That, that should sell the trip. No, see <laughs> yourself. Um, this map I put together to show an overview of the areas that we visit on this trip. Uh, we start out in La Paz. You can see down here, and La Paz sits in this geographical bowl that comes off the side of the Altiplano, the High Altitude Plateau. So it's slightly lower. Um, but when you arrive in La Paz, is about 1,800 feet. So it's still quite high. And one of the things that's really also unique about mountaineering in Bolivia is uh, 
we start out doing some touring, uh, sightseeing around the country, cultural sites, archaeological sites, some, some hiking. It's not in the mountains. Before we can get up to the mountains, our lowest camps in the mountains in Bolivia are about 15,400 or so feet. Uh, below that, we have villages, and that's where people live. So we have to spend a little bit of time, uh, and we get to, so it's gorgeous, spend a little bit of time touring outside the mountains before you get to go up to the mountains. So we start out in La Paz, and um, we will spend a day there, touring, gear check. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. Uh, and then we'll leave La Paz, and we'll travel out to Tiwanaku, uh, which is an archaeological site, it's a UNESCO World Heritage Site, and Bolivia's most important uh, archaeological area. And then we'll travel our way over that same day along the coast of Lake Titicaca, which when the sun is shining, it looks like the Mediterranean uh, pass over the Strait of Tequina. We'll pass over here by boat and then move over to Copacabana. And that's where we'll spend our first night outside the city at a hotel. Uh, and then the next day, we will go to a really nice overlook over Copacabana, travel by boat over to the Sun Island, hike across the Sun Island, and then spend a night at a, um, it's a family run eco lodge on the Sun Island. So we'll spend a couple of nights touring outside the mountains, that, reverse our steps, we uh, get, hike a little bit further down the other side of the island, get back on a boat, head to back to Copacabana, get in a vehicle, reverse our steps. And this time we don't go back to La Paz, we go all the way up into the mountains now. Um, and then we go up into the Condoriti region. And that's where we'll spend uh, five nights climbing uh, Pico Austria, is a trekking peak. And then Pequeño Alpamayo, which is a, is a glaciated peak. Really, really fun aesthetic peak. Five nights in there, we'll also do some training on the glacier, um, sometimes some ice climbing. And then after our five nights there, in the climb of Pequeño Alpamayo, we will come back to, because things are so accessible in Bolivia, we'll, we'll drive back into La Paz, spend a night there, get a shower in a hotel, refresh, um, and then make our way back out to the mountains again, this time up here to Chachacumani. We will spend uh, four days climbing up Chachacumani, moving up from the base camp to high camp, um, hopefully up the summit and then back down and back to La Paz. If your trip is ending at Chachacumani, this trip comes in two, two ways that you can plan it. You can plan for this 16 day trip, which would take you on all of this itinerary we just discussed. And then you can also decide to add on four more days to go and climb Ilimani, which is down here in the corner. So you go out the totally opposite side of La Paz, a very different area of the mountains and climb an even uh, taller and more spectacular peak at the end. So either 16 days, add on four days, Ilimani on the backside, and then it becomes a 20 day trip, counting the days of travel from the US to Bolivia and back in that itinerary. But we're gonna go through it um, day by day. So this trip, uh, the way I've, there are so many peaks that you can climb in Bolivia, uh, an immense variety uh, that we could just pop into different areas. And I've tried to choose peaks in this itinerary that are really, really just beautiful. They provide a really good progression for us in terms of mountaineering skills, in terms of our altitudes, so it works along with our climatization plan, uh, and then sort of progressing up through on that vein. We'll, we'll start off with uh, our first peak is a trekking peak. So there's no glacier, uh, there's no rope travel, just trekking, hiking up to Pico Austria, 17.5 more or less. And that'll give us practice with the altitude, some really great views, hopefully. Um, and then we come back down and we hike our way up to the glacier the next day. I'm going off the other side from our camp. And there we get to practice all the skills that we need to move forward up to our glaciated peaks, um, to get on steeper terrain, pieces that are, are will depend group to group. Uh, and then from that same camp, so these first three peak while steer glacier skills practice, and then picking up a Mayo are all from the same camp, which is also really fun too. Um, picking up a Mayo, we'll move to has, that is our first glaciated summit. You'll notice it's just about the same elevation as peak while steer. So we've already gone up to that, that altitude on a trekking peak, and now we're gonna do it. Uh, going over glacier, there's a steeper train, there's a little rock scramble, there's a variety of, of pieces involved to that mountain. It's a really, really uh, varied 
bits to them. And oftentimes we climb up a mountain, we climb up the glacier, and we go down and Pico Mayo is a lot more dynamic than I'll show you pictures. It's, it's quite a, a different peak. And then we get to go back to La Paz, right? Come back out, spend four days on Tachikumani, which is we're going to gain a lot more altitude. We're going to get on a much bigger glacier, glacial structure, um, deal with going around more crevasses and, and navigating. And then uh, that will set us up and prepare us to go to Ilimani, which is even higher. And then Ilimani is a big glacier with more prolonged areas of steeper or more exposed terrain than, than Pequeño Pomayo. And so it all kind of builds up, which is, is uh, the way the itinerary is designed. So it also helps us to be an itinerary that if you are looking for something to progress your skills up in higher altitude, uh, different kinds of terrain on bigger peaks. That's actually the way that the whole trip is designed. So it's a good fit. Logistics for arriving in Bolivia. I'll talk a little bit about some of the pieces and um, there's a lot more information about the logistics on the website under the logistics tab for the uh, Great Peaks of Bolivia trip. But just an overview of, of some of the pieces that would need to come together as you're preparing for this trip. Uh, flights to La Paz on the itinerary day one is a day you're traveling and you'll arrive day two into La Paz unless you decide to arrive a day early, which is great, which is awesome for if you have the time for acclimating and getting rested before you dive into the trip. Um, but on the itinerary, you'll be arriving day two in the wee hours of the night. So all the flights arrive 2, 3, 4 a.m. Um, no matter how you look, you probably will not be able to find something changes um, and a trip. A flight that will arrive at a decent hour. So you can arrive in the middle of the night, but the hotel reservations are set up so you can arrive in the middle of the night. They know you're coming then, everybody arrives then. Um, so you'll be able to get to your hotel room, shower, get a few hours of rest, um, have breakfast at the hotel. They have a buffet breakfast there and get all ready for the next day or actually that same day when we'll do our gear check. US citizens need a visa and you can get that visa on arrival. The requirements for tourist visas in Bolivia change somewhat frequently, uh, which is a little bit interesting sometimes to, to keep on top of. But the uh, logistics tab on the website for this trip has a really detailed list of everything you need to get your visa, your tourist visa on arrival at the airport. Uh, if you Google this information on the internet, you will get tons of different uh, lists and answers. The um, Bolivian government does a horrific job of communicating the correct information. Uh, so do pay attention closely to the list that's on the website that we've put together for you. Uh, one of the pieces that you need is a hotel reservation letter, and that just shows the date that you enter the country, the date that you leave. You have reservations for hotels. Um, obviously, we'll be in the mountains a lot of the time, but kind of your leaving and arrival dates, you have a hotel reservation. We will get that to you. Um, I will send that to you. It's, there's one other little piece here that's that's pretty unique. I think uh, printing all of these documents, if you print out every piece of paper that is on the list of documents you need for that tourist visa, you will get through the airport a lot easier and a lot faster. It's kind of a, a funny thing. They really, really like paper documentation in Bolivia. So, and all these pieces um, you, will, you will get on the website through reminders, but just to kind of go over what some of those would be. If you arrive on the scheduled itinerary day, which would be day two in the wee hours, uh, Alpine Sense guide, so usually that would be me, meets you at the airport, holding up an Alpine Sense sign. We take you down to the hotel so you can rest and then we meet again later uh, in the morning. If you're arriving early to La Paz, um, you can contact the office if you'd like to make additional hotel reservations for you, arrange a pickup from the airport, uh, I do highly recommend actually that you make those hotel reservations through Alpine Essence. If you do that, then I'm able to get a hotel reservation letter for your visa to you that reflects those dates of hotel reservations that reflect when you're entering the country. Um, if you book them on another hotel and you get a letter that reflects that date of the hotel reservations for your visa. So it makes it a little bit more complicated. But if you just let us know, we'll make reservations. Probably the easiest way to do that. I don't recommend taking a taxi from the airport. You're arriving in the middle of the night and taxis are not well regulated by the city. Um, and so they're not totally safe 
to just take a random taxi from the airport. So either let Alpine Ascents know, I'd like this airport pickup, um, or you can arrange that with a hotel, but arrange a pickup before you arrive. Um, and then as you're traveling, so you're going to arrive at almost, the airport actually is, is above 12,000 feet, it's about 13, uh, even higher than that actually. Um, but when you arrive, you're arriving at high altitude, you're going to go down to about 11, 8 to sleep. But you'll be really, really benefit from hydrating while as you're traveling. Uh, oftentimes we're traveling on planes and we get dehydrated because we don't want to get up and make people move in the seat. But this is an instance where it's pretty important to stay hydrated and arrive hydrated uh, to the city. And then if you arrive early, moving around nice and slow. It's really, really taking your time uh, for the first couple of days in La Paz and not, not pushing it. Everything's hilly, so <laughs> moving around slowly. Uh, other details uh, for cash, how much cash you could maybe bring, where to exchange currency at the hotel uh, in La Paz has been exchanging currency for us, US dollars, at a really decent rate. That's a safe, easy way to do it. Um, you can plan to bring money for, so your meals in La Paz are not included in the trip besides the welcome meal. And that's just a case of we arrive kind of back for these couple, you know, nights in the city to shower and recoup and then go back out to the mountains. And so usually it's easiest there for everybody to kind of figure out a meal in the hotel. The hotel has a restaurant or some people like to go out and try some different restaurants. So you'll need some money for that, usually about 200-ish dollars and that you will want to change to local currency. And then uh, Bolivia has some pretty fun souvenirs with textiles woven fabrics, shawls, um, really, really bright colored table runners and cloths and there's all sorts of things. So usually people end up with some souvenirs too for a little bit of money for that. And um, if you are planning on bringing money for tips for local guides, um, US dollars were great. You don't have to worry about changing that at all. Uh, and then I will get in touch with everybody who signed up for the trip with all these details, make sure everybody's got everything all squared away. So um, you will get my uh, contact, local contact and email and phone number and all that. So all these deals uh, can come together in the moment. I should mention this is our high camp on Edie Money. It's a pretty spectacular spot. So as we begin our trip, um, everybody's arrived in the middle of the night, we can get a few hours of rest. And then about usually about 10 a.m. ish, we meet together in the hotel to do a gear check. So what we'll do is we'll pull out all of our pieces of equipment, make sure we have everything we need for the trip, uh, really pay attention to the gear list. We can actually get quite a few pieces, but definitely not all the pieces and definitely not at the kind of quality you can get in the U.S. really to bring the things that are on the gear list. That is, go through that piece by piece, talk about how our, our trip in the next few days are going to look uh, in the hotel. We'll have a meeting, we'll go out and we'll have lunch. There is a newly thriving uh, culinary scene in La Paz where they take Bolivia has, and this area of Bolivia especially has access to huge amounts of ingredients and flavors and grains and vegetables and fruits from you know, fruits from the Amazon combined with high altitude ancient grains. And so there's a uh, culinary movement that's growing and, and there's some fun restaurants that are, are putting together meals. Um, we will have lunch together and then we will tour the city. We will both walk and then also you see the picture up there in the right hand corner of these uh, cable cars. So because the Paz is constructed into this geographic bowl, it is really, really hard to zigzag your way up and down the hillsides. And so they've built a cable car network, which is uh, the world's there's another one's world's highest, world's highest and longest cable car network, something like that. But it's a great way to see a city. So we'll, we'll fly over the top and stop at different areas. We'll go to markets. Um, you arrive on a Sunday, which is the, one of the days where there's one of the largest street markets in the world is going on. We'll fly over the top of it, walk in it a little bit, um, explore for a bit in La Paz and let our bodies catch up with that elevation for the next day. So the next day, this will be um, day three of our itinerary. We leave La Paz, and we'll travel out to Timonaco, right? And then we'll come back around this way, travel along the shores of Lake Tibicaca, and spend the night in Copacabana. The shore of Lake Tibicaca looks something like this. Um, so when I'm in ruins will be our stop for the first part of the day. And uh, 
what is special about those ruins even more than the ruins that are there admittedly are not as spectacular as something like Machu Picchu. But what they do do for us is you will find, and this is, it's fascinating the way you will find things there uh, that are 2000 years old, that you will then, when we go to the mountains and the rural areas, you will see people eating the same food that they found uh, remnants of in those ruins, uh, practicing some of those practices that they did 2000 years ago and trace these pieces of how this culture has just preserved a traditional way of life like few other cultures in the world at this point have. And it's, it's pretty fascinating to get that base to start as we kind of start to ex understand the area that we're at. And we'll travel along the shores of Lake Titicaca. So our hotel in Copacabana is a little bit higher, about 800 feet from the hotel in La Paz. We, it's a, you will have, it's a full hotel, showers, uh, real beds. We will have um, our meals, some meals there, etc. just a, a full normal hotel. Um, beautiful on the shores of Lake Titicaca. So we'll, you can usually watch the sunset over the lake from your balcony. Uh, the next day, we'll get up. And um, one of the things that's really fun to do is this photo up in the upper left-hand corner is taken from an overlook over the town of Copacabana. So it's a fun way to get a little bit of elevation, stretch our legs, and get a really good view of, of the city. So we'll do that usually. Um, and then we have to get on a boat to travel to the Sun Island. And we'll travel by boat um, about an hour and then uh, take some stops at some ruins and we'll go up to the north side of the island and we'll get connected to a trail that crosses the entire island. And it's, um, they call it maybe an Incan trail, but it's even more and more, uh, it's older than that. It's probably some, some thousand year old trail across the island or more. Uh, and so that's really fun to walk across. You walk across the crest of it with, you can see, this is one of the photos from our lake, uh, the views across the lake back to the mountain range. And then we'll stay in an ecologist It's run by a family that is local to the island there. And they have lovingly built it piece by piece and they um, do a really, really nice job. So it's, it's fun to support them. All right, so then the next day, we finally uh, go up into the mountains. And uh, you can see on our map here again, just to kind of get your orientation, we will have woken up on the Sun Island, day five. We will hike about an hour back down to the boat dock, crossing the rest of the island that we haven't crossed yet. We'll get back on a boat for about an hour, travel to Copacabana, and then make our way all the way up to the Condoriri region. You can see that on the map there. Our hike will be um, about, two hours usually we take to get into our base camp and we'll establish our base camp. Uh, actually on this photo, you can see it. I can get my cursor going, there you go. Right in there will be our base camp and we're gonna spend five nights there. So we'll hike in along this side of the lake and then make our base camp right here. Uh, for this move, for all of our moves in the mountains from up to base camps, from base camps to high camps, all of our group gear, all of our tents, our food, uh, your personal duffels full of the things that you do not need for the day, your sleeping bag, your, your sleeping mat, your, your whatever the extras are, will be taken by, um, I wonder if, if moving my screen, it will move it on yours, I'm not sure. But will be taken by uh, donkeys, not mules, donkeys, up to our camps. And then on Ili Money, we'll actually have porters, but most of the places we'll be at, we'll have donkeys carrying that gear. So all the way through the trip, um, you will be carrying a trekking pack basically. And then a couple, there's a couple of days where we'll add in a little bit of, of climbing gear there to get up to the, the foot of the glacier when we're in Kondoriri. But otherwise we're um, mostly just trekking packs the entire trip, which is also one of the ways that it's a good trip to kind of dip your feet into higher altitude uh, because you're not worrying about carrying all of the huge weight up at high altitude. You've got a, a trekking pack to work with and then uh, start to get used to it all. This is, let's move this, there we go. So this is a view of our hike the next day up to Pico Austria. You can see our base camp marked and then the red line that goes across um, and where the dot, dot, dots are across that we're going back behind. We're not actually scaling that face. It's a, <laughs> a bunch of loose rock <laughs> which has in this picture, but um, it's back behind is a, is a trekking route up to the top of that peak and it has a spectacular view over. You can see back to Lake Titicaca where we came from. You can see over to the jungle side of the mountains. 
uh, and it's a really, really great way to start acclimating, get up to the same elevation, pretty much that we're going to get to on Pagampa Mayo, but do it on a trekking peak first and get our feet wet and then go do it in a more technical form in a couple days. So it's usually about um, seven hours round trip up and down from there. So you make a day of the whole uh, trek up. And uh, I'll show you from this screen as well. Um, this is a bowl of, there's 13 separate peaks here that you can access from the same base camp. So pretty spectacular to be able to look up at all the different peaks. Ours is right up here back in the corner. You'll see one that's marked Pico Tarija. And we're gonna have a closer up view here in a second. Um, but Pico Tarija is a peak that we cross first before we climb Mayo. You'll see it close up in a little bit. So continuing to prepare ourselves for uh, picking up a Mayo, we will have a day of glacier skills practice. The picture of the toe of the glacier is about an hour and 20 uh, at this point up from our base camp. So we will hike up there and then spend the day on the glacier practicing skills that vary depending on group interests, group uh, experience levels, what conditions we're seeing, what things we see that we will need to have uh, fresh in our minds for our upcoming peaks. Uh, one thing that you can see here is uh, this picture on the right. We often have a uh, rain that is really, really hard frozen compact snow and or ice that you see in this picture. So we will definitely spend a lot of time on precise cramponing, getting efficient and more comfortable with our crampons on terrain that is quite different from what you find, say, in the Pacific Northwest, if you've done like a Rainier or a Baker. Uh, and so it's really good to practice that before we get up on the peaks. We practice like uh, glacier travel, make sure that's fresh in our minds. Uh, sometimes add in topics like uh, team crevasse rescue. I think that's something that is super, super useful and um, we don't always run across in all of the programs. So variety of things that we could play around with there. We'll spend a day on the glacier getting ready. And then the day after that, we have some options. We have, it's designed to be rest day because in the nighttime we'll be getting up at about in the, in the early wee hours uh, to go climbing up a Mayo. So some folks prefer to just stay at base camp, enjoy the lake, read a book and rest. Others, uh, if we can find a spot, it doesn't always form very well, but usually we have some spot we can go and find some ice climbing uh, for folks who'd like to go up and ice climb for part of the day. Right, and then the next day is our summit attempt day on the Yapama. So there's a trail, you can see a little bit of it down the corner here, we cross over and that's the toe of the glacier. This is the glacier we would have done our glacier uh, skills practice on down here in this lower toe of it that's kind of behind the ridge. Uh, but we will start off in the wee hours when it's dark and then climb our way up the glacier to, you can see kind of a, a pass here. Uh, we'll get up there and then it gets slightly steeper and we'll get up to, but still, fairly mild, um, get it to Pico Tarija. And that is actually our first summit of the day. So our summit of Pacampo Mayo is pretty unique in that we cross a peak and then we go down a little bit and then we climb back up again to get to the summit of Pacampo Mayo. So you get basically, and then we come back down, we're gonna cross it again. So you're getting three peaks in one. Pretty good, pretty good thing for your effort there. <laughs> um, this, so, if you're standing up on Pico Tarija, you're standing right here where this blue dot is, this is your view now. Um, so this is a closer up view of the summit. The summit of Pico Tarija is up here. So I got this close up picture so you can kind of see some of the dynamics of, of behind that peak. So we get to Pico Tarija first, and then things get um, more varied and more interesting. We have a small rock down scramble, third class. Uh, so it's, it's, it's not anything that is technical at all. It's just, just moving your way down uh, a bit of rock, but it is quite exposed, so it feels quite airy, so it's quite exciting. So we go down, it's it's probably about 150 feet of down in the end uh, to this area down here. And then we will work our way up this bump here, down, <laughs> and then up to right here. When we get to this point, our um, climb will get steeper. Right here, from here to up here, there's about 90 meters usually of terrain that is could be 
uh, big bucket steps in the snow. And we could just tie ourselves in short and go up at short roped. Um, could be that it is turning quite icy. Uh, also happens quite frequently. And at that point, we would have um, guides going up, putting in acres and belaying people up, uh, probably a, a pitch and a half up there, or maybe just one, depends on what's going on. Uh, but steeper, airy, a lot of fun. And then we get up to this area right in here, and we have our last challenge before the summit. This area, uh, I used to say it was about 50 degrees right in here, but uh, as the glacier is changing, this is getting steeper. It's probably 60, you have to 65 now. Um, but this part, definitely, guys will go up, put up an anchor, um, and belay people up this last little bit. And this last little bit is really only, it's about 20 meters where it's um, steeper. And then you have this tiny little walk about five minutes back to the summit itself. Once we have been at the summit, taken our photos, we reverse this process. Uh, so we'll walk up to this point right here. Guides will lower clients down to this point here. Um, we'll have a station here. And then usually most of the time, unless the conditions are really, really, really stellar for us, we'll do one 30 meter um, lower here and then another 60 down to here. So it'll be lowered back down. So don't worry about down climbing your way down it unless things are just you know, gloriously big bucket steps. We'll usually be lowering people back down this, reverse, we go down a little bit more. And then uh, the funnest part of the climb is a little bit of up at the end. <laughs> so we go a little bit up here and then we have the, go up that rock scramble and then we'll make our way back down the um, larger glacier at the bottom. So this, this peak is oftentimes a favorite for, for folks on this trip because it's just so varied. You get so many different little pieces and that we don't often get on one mountain climb. Um, go back down, back to the base camp on the day that we summit began for a mile. Day 10 is hiking from the base camp out to the, where the road ends and then we'll travel back to La Paz, have that night in the hotel. Uh, get a shower, refresh, and then go back out to uh, climb, which is a four-day endeavor. And so we spend the first day, we go from La Paz up to where the road ends. This village is called uh, Alto Cruz Pampa, is the name of the village where the road ends. And then we hike up to the base camp. It's about a three-hour hike up to the base camp, and that's day one on Chachikumani. Day two, we hike from the base camp up to the high camp. And then uh, day three, high camp up to the summit, all the way back down to the base camp. Uh, and then day four is base camp, out to where the road ends, and back to La Paz. So that's the, the four day itinerary on Chachikumani. Uh, this is a mountain that it was about, at this point, about seven years ago, was not open to tourism yet. The local communities down below the mountain uh, did not want tourists to come in there. They uh, were not open to outsiders. And then little by little, they discovered uh, that they did actually really want to work with these groups. They discovered they could use, we would hire their, their donkeys. Um, they portered loads up and they could, they could make a really good income from working with tourists and, and they found a lot of, of fun in actually the, the um, head of the, the group that uh, organizes the donkeys for us on this peak has been up to the summit now a couple of times and they've, they've uh, developed this relationship with tourism that, that's um, healthy and, and, and it's become something really good for their village. Um, but what that does mean is that this is a peak that not many groups climb yet um, because it's even more kind of off the beaten path of the beaten path. <laughs> and it's got this huge glacier uh, and really, really gorgeous views from the top. You're in the heart of the range by the time you get to the top of this peak. We uh, start the first day of this picture in the lower uh, left-hand corner down here. We hike up this really big wide glacial valley and get to a base camp at the end of it, and then uh, hike up to, in this upper right-hand corner, this was our high camp last year, very much at the toe of the glacier. So we camp at the very toe of the glacier. Uh, there's a little lake down here, the, they've named it Heart Lake. It's a little heart-shaped, it's beautiful. And uh, these other two pictures, it's from lower down on the glacier, once we start climbing up. And then the picture in the lower right-hand corner is getting up close to the summit, close to the summit of the peak.
this photo uh, is a great way to get a view of more or less the entire route. Uh, this photo has a fun backstory. It was taken from an ascent, a, a first ascent on a peak, kind of the opposite way that's called the peak. It's called, it translates to the, the place of the stars. It was a super, super fun day. We got this really neat view of Chachikamani to be able to show you this photo. So our high camp here, and then our base camp is down below and here behind this ridge, you can't see it, but this is our high camp. So this we camp at the very base of the glacier. And then we work our way across and you have to find this one little passage that gets you up through the, the really, really heavily crevassed zone. Make your way through that passage and then we get into an area in here, which has large crevasses to they're sometimes quite hidden to navigate around. Uh, and then our route goes behind where we can't see back behind here, curving around, reach a little steeper section, nothing as, as steep as on Big Anapa Mayo, uh, and work our way up, crossing up the Burge Run. And then this peak here looks like it could be the peak, but it's not the highest one. The highest one is actually back here in the back, um, but they're very, very close. So we'll usually we'll reach this ridge here and make our way to the back. If you look at this photo on the previous slide, let me move this. You'll see that that ridge there is is not thin. It's not exposed. It's it's quite wide. And then the, the very very last little part, uh, we have this little summit triangle, which is quite narrow and and, and airy and and fun. But the rest of it is is not this scary narrow ridge at all. Even though it kind of looks like it from this photo. <laughs> Day fourteen. Um, is going back down from the base camp, right? Back out to where the road starts again, back to La Paz. And then we have a day, so day 15 the itinerary is, it's a rest day in La Paz. Uh, day two, if you wanna go grab any souvenirs, um, but it's also a day that we have built into the itinerary if we need something uh, for weather days, um, any, any kind of logistics that could happen to make sure that we have good chances on both of those peaks. So day 16, if you are not traveling onto Ilimani, you would be flying out of Bolivia. And if you are traveling to Ilimani, that's the day you would travel up to the base camp on Ilimani. This, all this photo I can show you again here. This is our base camp on Chachikumani is right in here. And then this is not the summit. The summit is back there at the tip of my cursor. And this, this valley is full of llamas, alpacas, all sorts of um, Andean animals. All right, so now we get to travel on to Elimani. Uh, if you decide to sign up to go to Elimani, which if this fits with the time you have, if it fits with um, sort of your progression in mountaineering, highly recommend it. It's a spectacular peak. It is more difficult than the previous peaks, but kind of as we've been going along, every peak has been progressively more difficult. And this is kind of the capstone of everything. It's got uh, steeper slopes, huge, huge, massive glaciers. Uh, and it's it's just a, such a spectacular mountain. Um, this is, I think the folks can speak for themselves on that. The picture in the lower left-hand corner is hiking up to our high camp. And then the rest of the pictures are from somewhere on the route. The one in the upper left is quite close to the summit. You can see uh, some other parts of the range in the far background there. Just a really, really beautiful mountain. And this, no, but this, there we go. So this is the um, best way that I could get a kind of an overview of the entire route of on Ilimani is such a big peak. It's about five miles long. If you go from crest to crest, if you start over here, go all the way around, all the way around to the backside, and it's got five peaks that are over 6,000 meters. Uh, you can, you actually can do a traverse of the entire thing, which is is, is quite a fun endeavor. Uh, and uh, so you've got, so one, two, three, four, and there's one back behind here, which is also over 6,000 meters. But this peak here with the red dot on it is the highest one, and that's the one that we climb up to. So you can see that our hike from the base camp up to the high camp follows this rocky crest. Uh, and uh, as we go up from the high camp up, there's an area right in here when you get above about 20,000 feet, which is called the stairway to heaven. It's about 700 feet of steeper terrain where um, depending on conditions, we might be also belaying and lowering people up and down it 
or just maybe down it, um, but depending on what's going on. So that's one of the more challenging portions of the route. So know that uh, Irimani is spectacular, an amazing accomplishment, um, but do know that you have to be at this point in the trip, good with your crampons, good on, on um, feeling really balanced on steep icy slopes and comfortable with terrain that feels pretty airy and exposed around you. So um, definitely still another step up from say a Chachikumani, but really, really a, a fun one to, to uh, attempt if that seems like it's in your plans. few details here for uh, how the trip is organized. So as I mentioned, we have donkeys. Most of the most of the way we have donkeys carrying our supplies um, on all of our moves on Ilimani. We have horses that go up to the high camp. That area is uh, too steep and exposed for the donkeys. Uh, there's llamas in the photo here. Very, very occasionally we have llamas also <laughs> uh, porting our gear, but they're, they're a little bit harder to um, uh, corral than, than the donkeys are, so not as much. Uh, we have everywhere that we have a base camp, we will have a large base camp dining tent that has tables, chairs, um, all of the uh, plates, cups, spoons, uh, all, of, all of the kit. There's a separate tent that is our uh, cook tent where the cooks will be working on the food. And then we have a dining tent. And uh, so we have on a trip, say, that has eight, nine people, we have a head cook and then he's got a couple of assistants. So we eat really, really well on these trips. We're really well taken care of. Uh, and then uh, climbers will be staying in expedition uh, tents that are meant for uh, three people. They're three person tents. We'll have two people max in each of them. So everything should be quite spacious and comfy. Uh, we also have, so for bathrooms, uh, when we're in Kondoriri, the community there has, it's more of a area where the community has organized that they've put together these uh, structures for bathrooms that we'll use. And then when we travel anywhere else on the mountain, we will have a bathroom tent. It's sort of like this, this pop-up square tent and we've got a, a, a seat there, um, all, the, all the niceties and it's a nice setup. And except for, um, we won't take that up to the Ilimani high camp and there's just not a good setup for it there. But that's the night, that's the only night where we'll just have a wag bag system. But otherwise we have a, a whole bathroom tent and then um, for times when we're traveling between camps, we will also have wake bags available for any number two bathroom uses between camps. Food. <laughs> Food is an extremely important part of an expedition. So what will we be eating? Uh, this photo here is uh, pancakes that they made for us after we had summited Ilimani on the last trip. Uh, and it was really, really well done. But we will have, so breakfast are things like uh, pancakes with all the stuff to put on it, maple syrup, peanut butter, Nutella, whatever you might want to put on it, um, teas, uh, fresh pressed coffee. Uh, we have scrambled eggs a lot, uh, cereal, granola, fruit, papaya, um, bananas, just a variety of, of lunch, or sorry, breakfast foods. Lunch is, uh, oftentimes we are on the move, when we have lunches, they will be packed lunches that will be um, like a sandwich, uh, some fruit, could be some chocolates or cookies or crackers or granola bars, those kind of things. If we have a lunch where we're having a rest here, we're more around camp, we might have actually a sit down lunch. Dinner is uh, starts with a soup. They uh, Bolivia specializes in making uh, really, really nice uh, vegetable soups, quinoa soups, uh, they're, they're very good at soup. That's <laughs> one of my favorites. Uh, and then we'll usually have a main course. Could be something like um, we've had chicken curry with rice. We've had uh, sauteed vegetables with some sort of a meat in it. Um, we've had some, we'll have oftentimes trout from the lake that we're camping by when we're in Kondoli. And then usually end up with a dessert, which would be a piece of fruit or um, pudding or, or, or whatever they've, they've come up with. So we eat really well. Uh, should I bring my own snacks? All of your snacks when we are outside of La Faz, all of your meals, those are all included. Those are all provided for in the trip. However, everybody has the snacks that make them happy and that fuel you for your uh, 
high energy physical activity, right? Or they keep you going and motivate you. So definitely bring some snacks that are just things that you know that are important to you, things that you like, things that you're used to when you're exercising and climbing the mountains. So bring a supply of those that, that you think maybe fit best for summit day kind of things. Um, but know that if you were to not bring any of that, totally all the food you need is there. But you can add in some stuff of your own. It's just the comfort foods that you're like and you're used to, right? Uh, what if you have special dietary restrictions? Great. Let us know. Um, you can note that on your application for the climb. Also, if something changes in the meantime, you can get in touch with this. I will also, I'm always in touch with folks to sort of understand better what whatever they marked on there. Um, just let us know if it's a uh, vegetarian or, or, or allergies, uh, let us know. And uh, I get asked this over and over and over again. <laughs> just gonna, the couple spoon. We do not need to pack those. They're, they're not on the gear list because um, as you can see in this photo, we have an actual table set up, uh, super luxury. So how many climbers in the group? This uh, is planned for eight to nine climbers is a full group. You could have four climbers as a small group or we could have eight, nine full groups. So somewhere in between there. Uh, the guides on this trip are you have, so I'm the lead guide on this trip, and then I work with a team of Bolivian guides. I've lived in Bolivia for the past 10 years and spent uh, 10 years guiding there and working um, with different Bolivian guides. And so the guys that we work with on these trips are people that I know really well. We've worked together a ton and I trust them. Um, so they are Bolivian local guides and, and really, really uh, good folks to have on our trip. For people I'm really excited to work with. So. Um, we will have a ratio of one guide for every two climbers. Um, so that gives us options for you. You saw I talked about a lot of sections where we might be belaying, we might be lowering people down sections. So we have a lot of guide resources for that um, and for figuring out any eventualities that come up in our trip. So uh, two climbers for every guide. So me from the US and then uh, a team of local guides. This is also a view from the top of Ted you can see Illimani here in the back. I'll point that out. This one right back here is Illimani. Gear. So uh, on our gear list, we have a 55 liter backpack. And some folks say, well, they, who are calculating this, if I'm just carrying my trekking supplies, why do I need a pack that's that huge? Uh, Bolivia is high altitude and also quite close to the equator. So what happens is we have these massive, especially May and June, when these trips run, massive temperature swings between the day and the night. Our summit temperatures in the middle of the night might often be around zero or a little bit more than that. But then the sun comes up and if it's not windy, it feels like it's 90. <laughs> so we might start out with all of our uh, puffy layers on our biggest jacket, our biggest gloves, our puffy pants perhaps. And then the sun comes up and it gets really, really hot and we pull all of that off and we might end up coming down in just a sun hoodie. <laughs> so we use space basically for all that puff is part of the, the reason for the uh, pack size. Otherwise donkeys are gonna be carrying uh, at all times, all of those pieces of gear that we do not need in our trekking pack for the day. When we are hiking, we will have uh, usually a couple liters of water, snacks for the day, whatever layers we need for the day. Um, things like, uh, you know, another pair of gloves, another jacket, those kind of things, and um, any bits of emergency kit or perhaps um, a small blister care of things. So just some other little sundries besides that, but um, should, should weigh not more than 15 pounds. The only time that we carry a bit more gear is when we hike up to the base camps, from the base camp to the glacier in Kondoriri. There we will add on our crampons, helmet, harness, usually in our backpack before we take them out and put them on when we get to the glacier. So that's the point where it weighs just a little bit more. So we've put 30 as kind of max pack weight on the itinerary. What else do we put in here? So trekking boots, just double boots. So we definitely need both. Um, basically anywhere that we're on snow, we'll switch to our double boots because we're climbing at that point. Uh, and then everywhere else where we're hiking and it's not snowy, unless for some reason we have years where a snowstorm comes through and we need our double boots to get up to Pico Austria. That happens sometimes, but otherwise if it's dry, we're in our trekking boots and then our climbing boots are for summit days, glacier practice days, those times when we're definitely on the snow and ice. I think that's good for that bit. 
All right, that was a ton of information, um, but I know I missed a ton of things as well. So uh, what questions have come up? <laughs> oh my gosh, Rachel, that was such a great slideshow. I am just, when can I get to Bolivia? Those photographs are <laughs> amazing. Oh my gosh. Okay, let's see. We do have some questions in the Q&A box. Um, Besides peak climbing, are there any treks in Bolivia like there are in Peru? Yes, yeah. So uh, we actually have on the website a trek uh, that's a Cordillera Real trek, and it goes on have this, so the northern end of the Royal Range. I don't know if you saw on the map, there's this big sort of glaciated area, which to get back in those peaks and climb, it takes more time but they're really fun to trek around. So there's a trek that starts um, going around a big massif and then climbs over a bunch of passes and you get views of all these peaks without climbing them, going on the glaciers. It's really, really, really fun itinerary. So we've got one on the website. Yes, trekking is awesome in Bolivia too. <laughs> I went ahead and I popped the link to that trek in the chat. So feel free to check it out. Um, okay, next question. How do the slopes compare to the six lines on Denali? up from Fort Peak Camp. Mm -hmm. mm, different. Let's see how I, how I explain this one. So um, Pequeño Pamayo, we, this is probably about 50 degrees ish generally, those, those 90 meters I was talking about. And sometimes on, so this changes on Denali too. Denali, sometimes it's uh, a soft snow there. Sometimes you have hard bullet ice there. And we'll have a variety of conditions there too, but it's a much shorter distance than on Denali. Um, and on Ilimani, it's not as steep as on the fixed lines um, on Denali. More of a, a similar length in, in terms of a, a long distance and actually even a little bit more depending on what's going on, but not as steep as on the fixed lines. Nice, all right. Um... Any other questions? I see no more questions in the Q&A. Going once, going twice. <laughs> ah, I have something in the chat. Um, ah, the gear list shows trekking shoes. Can we use trekking shoes versus trekking boots? Oops. I have the La Sportiva GTX trekking shoes. Specifically, the oh, the, yeah, okay. So, sort of the the main point of the question: um, What sort of shoes would you recommend for trekking? Mm, the shoes that fit your feet and make you comfortable. <laughs> That's how we start out with. Um, we need something with. Uh, if you have ankles that don't like to have a lot of support, or don't need to have a lot of support, it can be a less aggressive. If you like to have I have ankles that are a little bit, so our terrain has like rocks that move. And so generally most people will want a light trekking book that has a little bit of soft ankle support to it. Um, and that will give you that bit of support when we're walking on the uneven rocky terrain. So expect that the areas where we're using those trekking boots will have uneven rocky terrain on it. Um, but as far as specific boots and brands and find something that fits you really well, break it in, make sure it's working for your foot. It's not giving you blisters. Um, and then you can kind of decide a little less support, a little more support, knowing that it will be rocky, uneven terrain. So I'd probably go more towards the having the light trekking boot as opposed to the um, trekking shoe without the without any ankle support. Nice. Oh, great advice. Um, and if you, when you're looking for your trekking shoes, if you are torn between a bunch of different brands, like also mm -hmm. feel free to email gear at alpineascent.com with the boots you're considering. And we have people in the gear department here all year round and they're always ready to answer your gear questions. They are the gear experts around here. They're awesome. Um, okay, what do we have next? Can the, I'm just gonna, can the Illimani, I just messed up that pronunciation, sorry. Can the <laughs> Illimani extension be an option to be made during the two peak trip? Hmm. Yeah, yeah, I don't see why not. Yeah, we could probably do that. I, I'd say let's let's um, if if that's something that somebody wants to do, let's talk about it more specifically, and then I don't 
we could figure something out probably, but no, no guarantees either way, maybe I'll say. <laughs> All right, okay, so no guarantees. If it's something you're interested in, um, you should email alpineascents at climb at alpineascents.com and we'll mull it over and we'll give you an answer 100%. After you have time to think about it. Okay, excellent. Uh, next question, how does this trip compare to the volcanoes of Ecuador? Mm. These peaks are more varied, I'd say, more varied terrain. You're gonna be on more varied terrain, but uh, less luxurious. A lot more time in a tent, uh, a lot more time kind of out in the mountains than you would have on an Ecuador trip. I would say those are the main differences. Because Ecuador, you're climbing volcanoes, um, a little more of just a, a volcano up and down. These are peaks that are more jagged and have a lot of variables in the terrain. Okay. Awesome. Uh, okay, we have one more question in the chat. Uh, is the weather typically pretty stable during May and June? Tell us about the weather. Yeah, it is. So Bolivia is has long been known for having one of the longest climbing seasons of any uh, high altitude range in the world. That's changing. In recent years, it's gotten a little bit more uh, hard to predict, but generally we have really good chances of, of having good summit days. Um, without too much you'll see we didn't build in there's there's kind of one weather day in the itinerary uh, and usually we we haven't had much issues with with coming up with days that are good for summiting um, but what we will get so these are timed for may to june is time for when we have this sweet spot where the rainy season has ended and the cold has begun and everything is compacting and freezing down um, but it hasn't gotten to the point yet where it's getting really icy and, and super difficult. But it's also that point where the rainy season has gone away, but sometimes it comes in in these little bouts. So you might get a day where uh, we get some snow and then it clears off. Uh, maybe a week later, we get some snow for a day and then it clears off. That kind of a pattern is is pretty common too. Okay. Um, okay, so you have one question, Unamas, questions. Um, if we plan to ice climb, do we need to bring that gear as well? Nope, nope, we'll have um, all the gear we need for it. Yep. All right. Well, Rachel, thank you so much for this amazing presentation. I know I'm putting in my vacation request. I will see you in Bolivia. <laughs> hey, they can like worry about the office while I'm gone. <laughs> uh, for everyone else, um, this webinar has been recorded. I know it's chock full of all sorts of great information. We will um, upload it to our YouTube channel and also have it linked to our blog probably in the next couple of days. So if you didn't take notes, don't worry, it'll be live on the website here in a couple of days. Um, Rachel, any other final words before we uh, break for the day? I don't think so. <laughs> hopefully that was hopefully hopefully that gave information uh if you are just curious what in the world Bolivia <laughs> I it's it's a place where uh, not many people know that there are peaks there. I talk to folks who've climbed all over the world and then I say climb in Bolivia and they, oh, so you go trekking? No, nope, there's there's big glaciated mountains here. So it's a pretty cool secret. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Oh, well, thank you for sharing the secrets of Bolivia. Um, and we will hopefully see you all in the mountains. Thanks again, Rachel. <laughs> thank you all. Bye.